So now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome today's first speaker, April Jeffries, president of Ipsos's Global Ethnography ethnography and immersion specialty. April, you have the floor. Thanks so much, Ellen. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a mouthful, right? The <laughs> Ethnography Center of Excellence. So I'm going to be joined with my colleague, Liza Walworth, who runs our U.S. portion of the, um, of the ECE, the Ethnography Center of Excellence. Um, and today what we want to talk to you about is this idea of what we're calling the vibrant fringes. So, you know, we're going to spend a lot of time explaining what that means. But in essence, we found that we cannot operate in the middle of the averages anymore. And that when you start to look at what happens at the other sides of those bell curves that we always studied, that there's a lot of really rich, vibrant, wonderful stories that can be told and that can lead to growth opportunities as well as uh, ways for us to, to really uh, address people individually. So we're going to talk about that. And through that, we're going to use ethnography, which is a, a methodology where we really are talking directly to people. So you're going to be hearing in their words and in their voices, how people who live on these vibrant fringes, like who they are, what they've experienced, the things that they believe and don't believe, the things that they want and don't want. And then we're going to talk a lot about us as brands and businesses and what's the best thing for us to do. So we're going to give you a peek into their lives and then we're going to offer some tips for you to successfully navigate um, how to really talk to people who live on these vibrant fringes. So <clears throat> given that, let me just start with this disclaimer, okay? We are all very much in, engaged in our data and trying to understand the numbers behind what has happened. But always remember that every business problem is actually a human problem. And every data point that we look at comes from some kind of human behavior. So for us to be able to really think about this in a way that makes sense, yes, we have to analyze the data, but we also have to remember who the human is behind that data. So let me start with some data just to get us grounded in things that we um, may or may not know. The world is changing, everyone. We are not in Kansas anymore. So my little yellow brick road sort of illustrates that. Um, but I was looking at some numbers that are that are pretty astounding to me, and I thought I would share them with you. So this is basically census information. Some of it was from um, the CDC, and some of it was from Ipsos Proprietary Research. But what we saw was that not the non-Hispanic white population was at 61% in 2016. It is projected to be at 44% by 2060. So that majority non-Hispanic white is slowly, not actually not quite so slowly, becoming not so much of a, a majority anymore. And so playing to that as an average is going to be to our detriment. We have to start recognizing what is happening on either side of that. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what some of those changes are. For one, if you look at that 9 million to 34 million, those are people claiming to be of multiracial descent or uh, in terms of their personality, we are multiracial. Um, that's the difference between what people said in 2010 at the last census and what they said in 2020. Now, I will tell you some of that is a result of some more clarity around the wording, but this is a pretty significant jump, right? And when you combine that with the, the decline of non-Hispanic white population, you can start to see like what is happening. There's multiracial things that are going on. In addition to that, we saw that one in four people of adults are claiming to have some type of a disability. That's not what people used to be able to say or were willing to say. In addition, we've got stuff like, you know, affluent African-Americans are spending one and a half times as many as the average affluent American. And there's a lot of reasons behind that that we can certainly do another webinar on. But let's think about the spending power behind some of these, you know, vibrant fringe groups. Right. As same with the, um, the Hispanic market, the consumer buying power of the Hispanic market is two point five trillion dollars. Imagine if you can tap into that in a way that's authentic, in a way that's helpful. The other thing I want to point out is that Americans are saying 
that global and national brands should play a role in solving global problems. That is a very different role for businesses to play. And I think we need to acknowledge that. There's not as much trust in government. There's not as much trust in social media. We all know we live in our bubbles. So they're expecting businesses to step in and to help solve some of the big problems that are addressing the world. And I will say that Gen Zers tend to even think more so. So uh, this is a percentage that shows that Gen Z Americans will stop using a brand if its stance on equality doesn't align with their own. That's pretty different than what the role of business once was in the past. So given all that, that's the data. <clears throat> Let's look about of what is happening on these vibrant fringes, as we call them. We can see now that brands of the future can no longer play in this mainstream majority. There are things that are happening outside of that that are becoming more and more important every day. So we as brands and businesses need to reclassify who it is we're talking to and how it is we're talking to them and redefine the spectrum of people and who it is we're going to talk to. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Liza, who has been talking to some of these people that live on these vibrant fringes so that you can start to see some of what they think and what they feel and what they're saying. Liza? Thanks, April. So as mentioned, the Ethnography Center of Excellence, of which I am a part, uh, led this DEI study. And for it, we recruited directly from the vibrant fringes. We conducted two-week multimodal digital ethnographies with 12 individuals, and by extension, their parents, kids, uncle, grandparents, partners, significant others, you know, practically all their neighbors. Um, so there was great reach in terms of who we were able to speak with. Our sample hails from all around the United States and represents a range of intersectional identities. But rather than put key demos on this slide or attempt to introduce them myself, I am going to let some of them speak directly to how they identify. So just bear with me a second. I'll pull up our first video. Here's me in special education. I'm autistic. Whether it be for good or bad, like it does affect me. Um and like it's important that people know that because if I if I say something that's offensive or it makes them uncomfortable, I have to be like, oh sorry, that was not my intention. I have this intellectual disability, mm -hmm. it gets in the way. I identify as an environmentalist and a crafter and Japanese American belonging. It's like never feeling like you quite belong. I've like resolved some of that internal turmoil um, in a few different ways. I think part of it is having like other mixed race friends to be like, oh, the identity is mixed. Well, my mom is black and my dad is Japanese and white. My dad being like half white is sometimes confusing for people because like when you say you're mixed, they want you to be like, oh, I'm this and this. But like when your parents are also mixed, they're like, okay, I'm confused. My dad more so is kind of the more like i'm american i'm white you know like he talks i mean he even will mention like oh we have spanish blood in us you know and it's like it doesn't really matter to me i feel like i have a lot of pride in being mexican american you know um i would i mean i'm a, i'm american too like i'm you know I'm a part of this culture but i don't necessarily think that means i have to identify as white i identify myself as a black polyamorous woman so what it means to me is that we should be making space for all people to love mm -hmm. some, to love anyone the way that they choose. It goes into me being an ally for the LGBT plus community. It goes into me being an ally for my Muslim friends who may practice polyamory, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what it goes into me whenever I identify as a Black polyamorous woman. I'm a Black woman. I was born a black woman. I'm going to die a black woman. So I'm always going to identify as a black woman who just happens to love another black woman. I think some people make it more of a defining point in their life. Like I have a cousin that you can see her house from a mile away because she got rainbow flags and all that, you know, everything she got on is a rainbow. When I go to work and I take care of my people, I'm just fair. I'm your nurse. You know, sometimes 
everything is not for everybody. I think it was based on where I felt what needed to be shouted the loudest. So I'd be in spaces, a lot of spaces that weren't queer. And so it was very important to me to make sure people knew that I was queer. There's queer people in this space. Yeah, I'll identify as as queer, identify as Iraqi and Chaldean very strongly. The rest sort of like is secondary. Wow. Well, <clears throat> thanks for sharing that, Liza. And um, I think what you'll see as we talk to these people in more detail is that um, they've got a lot of bri- vibrancy going on. There's just a lot of cool stuff happening. And some of the language they even use, I just find beautiful, right? Making space for people to love the way they want to love. Um, things like that that came through. But what we saw from 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 our panel of people here, that there are vibrant intersections happening. Sometimes I'm a, I'm a black woman. Sometimes I'm a black woman who happens to love another woman. Um, you know, there's things that happen that cross uh, um, traditional lines that we have to acknowledge. And the more we acknowledge them, the less we talk in terms of stereotypes and the less we risk um, alienating people who live in these places. They have very vibrant expectations, and you'll see that they start have started to really come out and say, this is what we expect of businesses and of each other. They have vibrant experiences, and that's the next thing we're going to talk about, because the things that happen to them are things that you really need to have some empathy for going in so that you can come out with a way that talks to them and that um, addresses who they are very specifically. And when I say specific, I mean authentically. So um, they are very much into being free to be who they want to be, which sometimes could change from one time to another. So there's a fluidity there that um, didn't used to be the case. But um, that's sort of who they are. And with that, we've come up with some ways of addressing that that I'm going to let Liza share with you. Thanks, April. So I'm a part of Ipsos's Inclusion Council which draws upon expertise and experience from members across Ipsos's many service lines. And the Inclusion Council is leading the charge at Ipsos to design, recruit, and analyze using a broader number of lenses than have traditionally been applied. Some of our clients and even previously Ipsos have looked at things using two lenses. But if you think more carefully, and intentionally about who has been pushed to the fringes, it's amazing what you will find by expanding your scope from that of just race and gender to that of all six you see on this slide, race, color, ethnicity, gender, sexuality, life stage, generations, religion, nationality, ability, disability, which again is at least a quarter of our population, social class and others like socioeconomic status, and even cast. So when recruiting the study, we prioritized though who hit two or more of these dimensions so that we could really dig into their intersectional identities and experiences and see what those bring to bear in terms of their beliefs and behaviors. So as seen in the first video, each of our respondents is unique. Everyone contains multitudes, and I'd now like to share some of the formative impressions and experiences that they shared with us as part of this study. In terms of like a mixed race Japanese character, I still don't have like a great TV role model. So I think I was led to believe that being like blonde and white was the way that you are the main character. The first time I remember being discriminated against was in kindergarten. I was talking during like a lesson with my friend on the rug and I remember being the only one that got in trouble and it was a Friday and on Fridays we got lollipops but the teacher didn't give me a lollipop and she gave the other girl that was also talking during the lesson, a lollipop, who was, of course, white. I was one of very few children of color in that classroom. 
Well, I do know the fact that my parents identified as Jewish, no problem. We celebrated Hanukkah openly. You know, nobody made reference to the fact that there could be something wrong or perceived as wrong as being a Jew um, until we got to Indiana. And then immediately everything changed. The area that we lived in was, you know, very white. My mother suddenly was the one that refused to admit that, that our family was Jewish, started warning me about letting people know, but the cat was already out of the bag, it was too late. Because a little girl told me that I was personally responsible for killing Jesus. We're here cooking breakfast here with my grandmother. Cooking some sausage, grits. I've had some situations where, you know, I've just been targeted just because of the color of my skin, just point blank period. You know, one time I was driving, this was when I was in high school, I was going the speed limit. And I remember the police officer, he pulled me over. There was a car that flew past me. And I'll never forget, they were, you know, it was a white, it was a white guy. And um, he pulled me over and I was like, what did you pull me over for, sir? Like, you know, I'm going the speed limit. He said, uh, one of your lights was out. And I mean, I said, that, that's fine, sir. But I was like, did you not see the other car that was speeding? He was like, oh, no, 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 that, you know, I, this is more important. So, you know, that was just a, a one case of I saw where I just knew what it was. Yeah. So what have they experienced? The lived experience of people that are on these vibrant fringes. Well, this idea of being othered, and I want to mention, we all have known what it's like to be othered. Different situations will put you in that, right? Where you're just kind of different than the average. Um, and what that does to be able to relate to that, it means that you really can have some level of empathy for these people who are living on these fringes, right? This idea of just not feeling like you belong. What does that mean and how does that feel and how might you make someone feel like they do, right? This idea of microaggressions and little things that happen along the way. I love the story about the lollipop because that's the one where you see, you know what, in, in the grand scheme of things, how important is a lollipop? Well, it's super important for a girl in kindergarten. And it's sort of, it started a way for her to look at the world, right? Like, why did, why did that happen? And now all of a sudden, everything gets viewed through a very different lens. So microaggressions and things like that that happened early on in the experience are things that carry through. And you'll see that when they start talking about, you know, so what do we expect out of the bigger world? right? There are surprising communities that form. It's, um, I remember when I had my first child, it was like all of a sudden people who were mothers started calling me. I'm like, why are you calling me? But you be belong now to a community of people who have shared experiences, right? So they started to find those and sometimes they weren't necessarily expecting it. There are cultural acceptances and defiance, right? So uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, uh, my father may think this way, and this is how he brings the culture to it. Um, I don't want to think that way. I would prefer to think a different way. And I think as we talk to various people, there's various approaches to culture and what they expect and what they want to uh, claim and not claim. There is an appreciation for my individuality. It was interesting when Farah said, you know, when I go to work and I'm a nurse, I'm just me. I'm here to take care of your problems. I don't I don't need all the other stuff. However, the other stuff kicks in when I'm in different situations. So they have an appreciation for their individuality and they know when and where different things might become more important. They have experienced in the U.S. extreme polarization. We've seen it over the past few years, probably in ways we haven't in the past. And they're trying to reconcile that. What does that mean? And there is a new sense of history. What does history bring and what stories do we tell and what do we not tell? I love this quote by Alice Yu, who's actually from Tapestry, and she said it very clearly. I'm Asian. I'm American. I'm a woman. In different moments, I want to express myself a little bit differently. And our consumers also have multiple faces, facets of themselves that they want to express. So 
this kind of talks about that intersectionality and how we have to be able to navigate with people who they are at any point in time. So with that, I think we have some more videos, don't we? We do, we do. So now we're going to move on to how our respondents' experiences, as well as those of their friends and family, have shaped their beliefs and behaviors, <clears throat> sorry, their beliefs about the world and what they hope for the future. So here is film number three. What you see here are the academic achievements of myself and my entire family. Education is really big in my family. I'm a realist. I realize that if you're coming from a marginalized society, it is going to much be much harder for you to work your way up. But I'm still a firm believer, unless you can rap or play ball, your greatest ability to do so is through education. There was like this, this like understanding that you just have to work hard. You have to earn your keep. You have to like, don't accept handouts. Um, even the idea of like collecting unemployment or collecting food stamps, even though my family has been like recipients of those things, it was like shameful. So that was a bias that I had. And I think over time, I've grown to realize that that's all bullshit, right? And, you know, these systems, like we pay into these systems, these systems exist for a reason. And actually, these systems aren't even helping the people that need it the most. I wish I would have been proud of who I was in my culture. And like, you know, like, they're like, oh, my gosh, like, they they love tamales. And they're like, let's have tamales for lunch. And I remember, like, um, my mom would, you know, in my little mini mouse thermos, like, put, like, tamales in my lunch. And I'd, like, be at lunch and, like, kind of, like, eating it, like, hiding it. And my girls are just like, my friends know what it is. Like, we bring it all the time. I like the direction. For the most part, that the newer generations are going, I feel like a lot of them are very vocal. Um, you know, I see this in my little sister who's, you know, she's about to turn 18. There was an interaction specifically where my little sister, she wanted to wear a suit uh, instead of a dress to prom. And for some reason, my mom had like huge issue with that. Um, and I think, you know, it comes from that traditional side of, you know, Hispanic trying to show like hyper masculinity or femininity, right? My sister definitely has more of a tendency to present as someone who is or like a more masculine, I guess, in terms of how she dresses. And then I told her, like, it's totally fine. I'm happy that you stood up for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so she ended up going to prom in the suit. I didn't expect people to give me overwhelming jump up and down support for my multi ethnic family. Just give me respect. I respect everybody until I'm given a reason not to. It, it's just, it's insane to me that people will just randomly drop an N bomb or something about gender or something about sexuality. It's just like, I'm not here for any of that. Yeah. Just give me respect. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I think Rita Franklin had a song like that, didn't you, Liza? <laughs> anyway, uh, the point is. These are all people who feel we can do better. There's not a lot of, um, or I d we didn't sense a lot of, of judgment or even even anger necessarily. It was more about just let me let me be, let me do me, right? So when they talk about doing better, they've challenged things. They've challenged the American story. What parts of it do we claim? What parts of we of it have we tried to act like? didn't happen, right? They really want to hear the truth. They want to understand that. They want to challenge the American dream. Is this a meritocracy? Is it just something that if you work hard, you get more? And they're not seeing that and they haven't experienced that. So they've challenged that. This idea of protesting, I find interesting because they've seen it now in a couple of different ways that it can have impact, right? They've seen protests where you're marching in the street, for example, in 2020, where we we had a lot of that kind of, you know, outward marching together for a cause. Um, but they've also seen it uh, in social media. They've seen it online. They've seen ways to pull together to push their ideas. And I will tell you, employees now within our companies have figured out how to quote unquote speak truth to power. So they are pushing their ideas, they're pushing their beliefs in ways that they have learned make a difference and have an impact. 
For them, that authenticity and that ability to be who they are is all about freedom. That's what it means for me to be able to be myself. And by the way, to the extent that they can be themselves, they feel that is good for the rest of the world. To see me in all of my glory is what's going to make this better, make the world better, make the organizations I'm a part of better. And I talked about this a little bit in the beginning, this idea that businesses can play a bigger role in making the world a better place. Now, um, I'm going to show you some research we did here at Ipsos that actually showed that um, 57% of the people we spoke to said that it is appropriate for a brand or an industry to communicate their stance on equality issues, that it was appropriate, that should be done. What was interesting beyond that was that of those 57%, 95% of them actually expect that brands take a stand on equality issues. So it's not just a nice to have, it is actually expected. And it's an important expectation as we think about our brands and how we're going to talk to people in the future. So um, I think we now have some more videos to show you that kind of talk about what is it that they want from us as businesses and brands. Yes, they do expect more and they know that we all can do better. So in talking with everyone, it became apparent that after the murder of George Floyd, our respondents saw both steps forward and lip service from a range of companies. In the three years since, many of our participants have become even more aware of certain inequities and previously unknown history. Uh, Gregory, his birthday is June 19th, yesterday. He didn't know until a couple years ago about Juneteenth, even though that was his birthday and he is a African-American male. So they've become more purpose-driven in their own lives and in what they do, what they buy, what they want. And so we'll have our final video from them speaking to this themselves. People have started to realize like, hey, like, how are the extremely dark skinned women doing? Are you guys able to find colors, foundation shades? And the answer was no, nobody, you know, in the makeup community really cared too much. I will take any opportunity I can to purchase their products because just did such an excellent job of making sure that there was a wide um, foundation range for you know, people of color, but people with darker skin tones. This is a company that in my mind, we and I have a battle back and forth with having a type one diabetic son due to their cost of their insulin. When you talk about exclusion, we have to look at socioeconomic um, status for people as a method of exclusion. And when you have a medication that people who take it needed to actually live and can't afford it, we have to look at a company that provides this medication and is well aware of the fact that a good segment of the population can't afford their medication. And the fact that has taken the stance and recognized and addressed this problem and lowered the cost of their insulin to $35, which is obtainable for a lot of people, I think I have to give them their kudos when their kudos is due. They recognize that they are part of a problem, addressed it and fixed it. I don't think I know of any companies that are doing a good job with DEI. I don't see any tech companies having like, you know, like a proportionate amount of Black, Indigenous, Latinx groups. I just don't see them in those places of power, you know. There were some moments I felt like I felt heart warmed when um, in certain companies that I may have supported make a, a bold statement and say, you know, we that type of mentality does not belong or we don't represent that. At the same time, I I was always um, thinking this is all about money. I've kind of lost my belief in um, companies who need to do everything they can to keep themselves afloat. You know, these are all capitalistic enterprises. I don't expect them to not want to make money, but their whatever their social impact vision is needs to be in alignment with them making money and they need to be like together the impact that the 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 entity is trying to make or the social impact is a part of its core values 
and is a part of its mission. And I don't see very many companies doing a good job of that. All right. So that was just a small sampling. <laughs> there were many, many more exchanges with our respondents that echoed. Um, first, the 85% figure that April mentioned before, our respondents want companies to show up on issues that range from climate change to livable wage to offering an inclusive array of shades for those who use foundation on their skin. And they also echoed the Alice Yu quote, in different moments, I want to express myself a little bit differently. Our respondents operate in multiple realms within which their primary identity or top identities can shift, whether as a consumer, customer, patient, or as an employee, or as a member of various communities, which frequently tie to their identity or identities and their physical location. And these realms are interwoven. As we heard from Susan and Bashar, community overlaps with employee when you consider how companies can work to build an inclusive workforce from C-suite to entry level. And Bashar had a lot to say about this. He wants to see more company-funded scholarships for underrepresented groups. And he also told me about a tech fellowship aimed at helping BIPOC individuals gain skills and access to jobs where they've been historically underrepresented. So our respondents also want companies and brands to be consistent, not just across time or you know, strategies and tactics, but also across these three key people-oriented spaces of consumer, employee, communities. You know, Bashar said in the video, it's okay to make money. <laughs> Nobody's saying that that has to change. He just wants there to be, and others echoed him, there needs to be alignment a uh, company needs to have its social impact match up with its core values and mission you know, with its actual trade. Otherwise, it's just the virtual sig virtue signaling and profiteering that Gregory mentioned. So there needs to be, as you'll see from our little infinity loop here, there needs to be a revised stakeholder accountability. It's no longer just about the shareholders. Yes, the investors need to be happy, but you also have to consider the consumers, the communities, and the employees. All of this needs to come together in terms of thinking about the new array of stakeholders that a company has. I'm going to hand it back to April to say, now what? So what's a brand to do, right? This is um, this is different. It's different and it's new, but it's in that difference that we're going to see growth, right? We've got some tips for what we feel is effective inclusion based on what we heard um, from our panel of people. The first is you can innovate from the margins and then design for the masses. And I'll have a couple of examples of brands that have done that, um, but, it, but it's in those vibrant margins that you're gonna see where the new ideas are happening and how addressing some of those needs and then pushing that innovation into what's happening in the center is a great way to grow your brands and to do some great stuff, right? And as we see what's happening in that middle is actually changing. So how you do that um, will depend very much on what you hear from these fringes. This idea of approaching the margins with a cultural understanding. So culture really does drive a lot of behavior and so as, as we talk to people who are residing in these margins, we have to understand their context. We have to understand the culture that they come from and the culture that they're responding to. So, um, and, and we can help you with that. Ipsos is great as re at really understanding culture and the dynamics, as well as the signals and signs that are happening within a culture, because it will be different. It will play out in different markets in different ways. And even within the U.S., it will play out in different um, states, uh, depending on the culture of that state. So it's important to really think about things with that kind of mindset uh, in mind. Illuminating intersectional experiences, and we've talked about that quite a bit throughout this um, presentation, but this idea of no one person exists in one group. So 
as a black woman, yes, there's times you can talk to me about being black. There's times you can talk to me about being a woman. And there's times you really need to talk to me about being a black woman, which is something specific to that, right? So how do you eliminate, illuminate, not eliminate, <laughs> illuminate these <laughs> intersectional experiences, recognize them and really talk to them in a way that is authentic and that doesn't feel like they're just out to make money? Because what our people told us was, I get that you're a company. I get that money is the objective here. But can you make money in a way that feels like this is who you are? This is what you're about. And by the way, you've heard me in a way that other companies have not. So listening to and amplifying those voices are what tells them that they've been heard, that they've been seen, that someone is paying attention to my experience. And to the extent that you can do that and make money, they're fine with that, that's cool. But don't try to make the money without having heard who I am or or what I've said. So that kind of ties to this idea of making strategic choices, right? And that's all about your purpose, it's about your brand mission, it's about who you want to be. And a lot of times it's about where you started, right? So let's acknowledge your own history as a company, as a brand, as a business. See where that falls when it comes to talking to these people on these in these various fringes and then figure out where you want to go, who you want to be in the future. So given that, um, we have some thoughts around what inclusivity looks like. On one level, it's very executional, right? There's a, there needs to be a broad representation of all people. They are looking very clearly to see if they are represented in whatever it is you've shown, right? Are there a mix of people in what it is you're doing? And that broad representation has become table stakes, quite frankly. It, if there's uh, just a you know homogeneous group of people that you're showing, people notice. So <laughs> you've got to have that point blank as a as a baseline. The second executional thing is then actually referencing cultures and contexts, which is what I was talking about earlier, to do that in a very authentic way. So, you know, represent how they interact with family. Is there typically a grandmother that's present in that situation? Uh, how do they party? We've done some research where we've had people tell us, you're you've got a party here that doesn't have my whole family sitting around the table, right? It's understanding those kinds of authentic contexts that need to be represented in anything that you do. On top of the executional stuff, though, there's some more strategic things that need to happen. So, Lisa, do we have the strategic things? There they go. (laughs) So you have to have strategies that are driven by insight. So that's when it starts to get hard, right? These intersectional things are a little difficult because they change, they shift, they move depending on the context, depending on the situation. And there's insights in there that you need to really understand in order to drive your strategies. And then at the top of that is committing to a brand purpose that really does advocate for inclusion and societal change. All of the people in these vibrant fringes believe that the world will be a better place if you recognize us, if you start to see the things that we see, and if you start to understand that we are moving into the middle. So how do we do that in a way that ties to our brand, to our purpose, to what we claim to want to be in the future, and actively advocate for the people that we have strategically targeted um, as we move forward? So finally, um, we have some examples of Uh, some brands that we think have done a pretty good job at this. Nike actually have uh, have developed a hijab around um, Muslim women so that when they when they exercise, they have a thing that they can wear and they can do that in a way that breathes and addresses their specific needs. Now, there's a lot of talk around this, by the way, and sometimes you're going to have that a lot of talk. But in the end, these women felt heard They felt seen and they felt like Nike had addressed a need that they had been expressing. And it was pretty specific. When it comes to um, Fenty, 
And this is a, a really great example that was mentioned in um, one of those videos. Uh, Rihanna came in and totally upended this beauty market by addressing darker skinned women and having a range of colors that address people of all colors, right? $573 million business. And the entire operation right now is worth upwards of $3 billion. She has managed to find, and, and to be honest with you, I can't believe it's taken this long to have a company that really addresses these things, but she did it. She saw it and she addressed it and she addressed it in a way that was very authentic and that people believed in and supported and it made a big difference for her financially. And then the last example I have here is the one for uh, the Apple Watch. And what we found was that when they were designing that watch, they actually talked to people who were handicapped. They talked to people who had disabilities around hearing. And um, by doing that, they were able to develop things like haptic feedback and voice control which made it much more intuitive, by the way, for all of us. We all have gained from them having made those decisions and having listened to those people in order to develop the technology. So there's, there's several ways to approach this, right? One is by finding those niche places and really addressing their needs and figuring out what niche means because it's not just what we used to think it was, right? Niche has an intersectionality to it that we have to make some strategic decisions around. The other way, is by talking to people on these vibrant fringes and then designing for the masses based on what you've seen. There's two different ways of approaching it, but both are very effective when it comes to like how might you really look at these people on the margins and, and figure out how best to meet their needs. So given that, I have three key takeaways for you um, to walk away from this presentation. The first one is, you know what? The world is changing and we're gonna have to accept that at some level. So strategies for the future, you have to acknowledge that and you have to address the fact that demographics and attitudes and behaviors are all shifting. And they don't shift necessarily overnight, but some things are happening faster than others. And to the extent that we as brands and businesses can get ahead of them and watch the shift happening and be in front of that shift and making sure that we're talking to people who are now becoming the masses will, will be beneficial for all. So that's the first key takeaway. The second, these people on the vibrant fringes have traditionally been underserved. Typically, they are not people who we have been talking to. But if you talk to them, they really do have a very unique ability to expose and highlight what's coming, the emerging needs, and what's incremental. We've played in the averages for a very long time. So how do we start to find ways to build on that? And if we talk to these people in the fringes, that's one of the ways we might be able to do it. And thirdly, and this is super important, you have to listen and you have to talk to them. So deep listening to real people in real life will actually allow you to have empathy and to have an empathetic perspective into what's really happening with them. Don't try to make an assumption because it might not work. Um, Things are different than what they used to be. So really tapping into the genuine experience of people on these vibrant fringes, as we've chosen to call them, uh, is, is, a, is a great way to look at where you want your brand and your business to grow. It's interesting. I was talking to Liza about this earlier, but, you know, in the past, we've talked about these communities as being marginalized and being underserved. And all of those things are are true, uh, but they're positioned in a very, you know, negative way. I love this idea of this being the vibrant fringes. It's where all this rich, colorful stuff is happening, stuff that we haven't even seen before. And those stories are going to be the ones that will inform where we're going and where we're moving to in the future. So three key takeaways, understand the changing world, Look at the people on the vibrant fringes and look at their unique 
exposure to different needs and different um, growth opportunities. And lastly, really, really listen to them. Talk to them in their contexts, in their communities, and in real life so that you can start to understand what they're really feeling um, beyond what you may see in the data. So Liza, is there anything else we need to add to this before we start uh, looking at questions or taking questions? I think you summed that up perfectly. I love bringing in our prior conversation too. That was awesome. It was cool. So, <laughs> Looking at questions, we have one asking about navigating the risk of alienating current customers. Yeah, so um, high risk, high reward sometimes, right? <laughs> Uh, it is a great question because it, it's it's a delicate place to be. I would say, first of all, don't try to do this on your own. Really try to bring in people who understand the various contexts that you're looking at. The piece that you know as a business and as a brand is some of the things I was talking about earlier, the history of where you've come from and your future vision of where you want to go. If you can stick to those two things and do what we're doing authentically, you really do minimize the risk, right? It starts to become um, real and it starts to make people feel like you've, they've been heard as opposed to they've been taken advantage of. But you have to do your homework and you have to understand that and be honest about it. The other thing I would say is that the brands who have done this successfully sometimes do face some backlash and they live through it and they stand by it. And so what does it mean to be able to do that in a way that actually reflects positively on you, right? If there are people who don't like what you've had to say, can you position that in a way that makes it clear we've done this for the broader um, sense of good? And it doesn't make it feel like we just did this to make money. I think that's when people get in the most trouble is when um, they start to act like they've just done something great, but all it feels like is you're just trying to make money off me. And what you heard from our people today was, you know, I get that you have to make money. That is not the issue. The issue is, are you doing this in a way that's authentic and real and that I can trust you, that I can trust you to make those decisions in a way that makes sense? So other questions, comments, concerns? Mm -hmm. They're all overlapping on that. It seemed to be a top of mind area of concern, but I think you answered it well. So. Yeah, I would say, um, you know, go to the experts and ta continue to believe in who you are, where you've come from and where you wanna go and be consistent. We've definitely had um, people tell us that throughout this presentation. All right. Well, with that, back to you, Ellen. Wow. I would just very much like to thank April and Liza for bringing together this amazing presentation. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Remember to be on the lookout for an email to today's uh, recorded presentation that should be coming later this week. And then in the meantime, please do download the interesting research and POVs that we've uploaded into the control panel. At any time, we always welcome the opportunity to speak with you directly, so please reach out to us. That now concludes today's amazing webinar. Have a wonderful day, guys.